Hello, this is another uh, follow-up background uh, data on the uh, reenactment of the evergreen, ever-given grounding. And this time we want to look at wind, uh, wind and current. So wind and current, I believe, played a big factor in this event. And uh, again, we don't know uh, exactly what the wind or the current was. So we're only kind of piecing it together. Now, obviously, somebody knows. Uh, they've got instruments all along there. And the ship's v, uh, v, uh, um, VDR um, is recorded all of that wind instruments and all of their data. They have it. So when the, when the real analysis of this event takes place, they've got all that real data. But sitting here, uh, we have to just uh, speculate on what takes place. But we have a lot of information to help with that. So first of all, with regard to the wind, now a lot of the news broadcasts said there was strong wind. Nowhere said what, what, how strong is strong, and nowhere said what the direction of the wind was. Uh, but there was, uh, there was a lot of wind. And, but we can do is, what we can do is we look at the uh, reanalyzed GFS forecasts. So or actually, they're not forecasts. They're reanalyzed GFS model data and so we can get that from the GFS and we can get it from the uh, European Union from the European Union and and both of those uh, data they pretty much agree now it's not guaranteed that that's exactly what's happened it's inland it's inland and these are both global models but if we look at uh, and this program and again another thing we're doing is showing the versatility of the uh, QT uh, VLM program it will load several grib files at once and that has the advantage it can be like a high resolution uh, model for the coastal or inland and then when you sail out in the ocean it'll blend right over into the global model or you could be in the ocean or coast and you could have one one of these uh, grip slots could be um, uh, wind data another one could be uh, ocean current uh, RTOFs or something like that but Right now, we've got the one model here. There's, see, there's, there's a, these three slots here. And there's one we've got. I can turn that on. And this data is um, um, the, um, the uh, it, number one is uh, slot one is the GFS winds. And then so this is the winds. And now what time is this? Uh, this is at zero, zero. Let me change this and see. Yeah, that's 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. Okay, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. These are the winds. So the actual, the boat pulled off its anchor at 4 o'clock, roughly, and then headed north, and the grounding was at 5. So this is the time frame here. And you see, this is wind, uh, you know, nominal 20 out of the south. Um, we can look at a, a meteogram. And you see, here is the, uh, is that the wind? True wind speed in this area and and the boat and the and the event really took place between four o'clock four forty eight five here's where it went aground right here so you got that's say nominal 25 knots nominal 25 knots of wind but we also know and i didn't get it from this model and this is the right time see all the utc and then i didn't get it from this model but in this um in the uh, this is an overlay now of the gust of the gust distribution uh, in this uh, in this time zone from the uh, environment uh, uh, ECMWF European Community uh, Weather Forecast and then so this is now at four o'clock. Let's go back and let me go out a little bit and just show you that the. There's a lot of gusts here. And so these are now set up to overlay. It kind of hides a map. I haven't played with optimizing the transmission, I mean the uh, transparency levels and so forth. But these are gust, gust zones here. And if I read here, this is like a gust of 27 knots out here. This is 25 uh, 21, so forth. But now if we, and this, but the time here is one. Uh, uh, 0100 so that's way early so see and oh and oh I, I zip went too fast see I want to watch these gusts roll down in there you see like that 
So these gusts are coming down in here. Here's five o'clock. So that's about the time of the collision of the grounding. And what do we have here on the meteograms? Uh, Gus 36, 36 knots, something like that. So anyway, that's uh, what I wanted to show with regard to the wind. Again, we don't know what the actual wind was, but very likely the wind in here, um, the wind in here was, uh, was uh, t uh, t t you know, t 20 to 30 knots gusting to almost 40, 35 knots. Now, one of the things, this program is very versatile. You can be, now that's history, right? I'm looking at history. But I can also go in here and just do something like, you know, if I could do something just like that, little picture, just that little bay there, and I can show this. I can, I can get the, uh, the uh, wind, um, and the local, oh, it's a calm there right now. You see, but that's live. That's a live data of the wind. And then I can uh, step through that. Then, see, that's, so that w one of the things this program will do is just do a very quick, this is GFS data. There's all sorts of models you can look at, but that's GFS data. So that's just showing some of the wind functionality uh, uh, with the wind. But now let's get to, okay, and so this, this was a big issue. When this vessel's coming up here like this, going like this, this wind is right on the beam. So, uh, no, it's on the quarter, right? And so it had to struggle, it had to turn right against it. But I think maybe what is more of an issue is the tidal current. And uh, let's take a look at that, a little bit of the history of that. And this is uh, a little bit of a longer story. But see, let's go in here to the rules. This are the, these are the very excellent rules of navigation published by the published by the Suez Canal Commission. And one of the things that caught my eye is this note here. This is the southern region of the canal. And it tells us about it. The, the uh, tidal, they say the currents in the canal are tidal. And like 2.2 two meters, that's 6 or 7 feet uh, range. Not that much of a range, but then again, current speeds don't depend necessarily just on the range. This is a narrow channel. And so, and they say north is a flood. And here's the interesting point, that the peak currents of the flood occur uh, after high water, 30 to 90 minutes after high water. That's a key point we care about. And this region, the peak current is about 2.2 knots, except, look at this, in the spring, spring tides. Spring tides, that means near the full moon, uh, you know, near, full or, uh, you know, um, change or full, uh, new moon or no moon, uh, new moon or full moon, uh, it could be about four knots. And then it tells us where there's some buoys here. Okay, so now what we want to do is move on. We can go in here and figure out. Nobody told us any of this, and, you, you, and we can't, um, we have to figure out this on our own a little bit. But this program here, I can turn on tide gauges here. There's a tide gauge. Look at that, the Suez tide gauge is right here. So I can just turn that on. That's telling me, well, I don't care about that right now. It's telling me what the tide is, what the tide is right this moment. We don't care. But we can go back here. This is April 20th. Oh, that's today. Uh, well, here's the tide right now is whatever this is, 1.3 1 meters. But we don't care that. We want to go back to March, uh, March 23rd. March 23rd, okay. So look, here is, look at this. That's right at the time they pulled away from, that's like four o'clock. Four o'clock here they pulled away from the dock and here's about an hour. Am I on the right date here, March 23rd? Four, yeah, so that's high water and then right in this area, that's 30 to 90 minutes after high water. That's a maximum, the maximum um, flood going north. So let's look, oh wait, I shut that off too quickly. Let me come back, um, where's that book? Here, and then go to our little tide story. Here's our tide story. Okay, now um, they have, okay, so here's the information from, the, uh, from that book. I just re actually just looked at it with you. But here is in the tide gauge we looked at, and here's the canal, and here's the flood direction going that way. And then again, I mentioned these buoys. They're, they've got fins on them so that when the current's flowing, I guess, a current is flowing toward you. You see this side of it, red in that one reflector. 
two, re two reflectors the other way. Going out, and that's with a stern current. And that, that's what we believe the vessel had. And also potentially, potentially strong. But here's this. That's like here. Now, when is the full moon? It's over here. One, two, three, four days later. Well, that's not that far away. So if it could be four knots here, and the, you know... Uh, uh, four knots here and the average is two, then this could be three, you know, over three knots, a current. And the reason why this stern current is important is because the steering, your steering gets uh, sacrificed a little bit, gets compromised when you're in a strong following current. And in fact, uh, it's such an effect that the U.S. inland rules say the downbound vessel, that's with a following current, has a right of way over an upbound vessel because the upbound vessel has a better steerage. And here is just a, a quick note on what's involved here. It's not so much what you're doing through the water. When I turn a boat 30 degrees to the right, to the left here, 30 degrees to the left, it turns 30 degrees to the left. And in this case, I'm in, I've got no current. I turn 30 degrees to the left, and I'm actually moving 30 degrees to the left relative to the world. But if I'm in a following current, in a following current, when I turn 30 degrees to the left, again, I am turning 30 degrees to the left in the water, but the entire water is moving forward at three knots. So that dampens the effect of my turn relative to what matters. In other words, if I turn in the water and there's nothing around, I don't even know I've turned. I could look at the compass, say. But, um, but with regard to like a hazard, like let's say there's a rock dead ahead, there's a rock dead ahead of me. Well, when I turn to the left and I expect my normal turn to the left, I'm not going to get that turn. In this case, if I've gone eight knots with three knots, a current, I'm going to lose eight degrees just because I'm... The, the water is pushing me forward, and what matters is your course over the ground relative to the ground, relative to that rock, or in this case in the canal, relative to the side of the canal. Likewise, in the opposite, is if you've got the current against you, your, your, your rudders are much more responsive, and you'll see turns go uh, snappier like that. So this is, the, this is an issue that we have to keep in mind. So that vessel was headed up here, that vessel was headed up here with not only as, well, again, I have to say again, we don't know this for a fact. I'm just having to piece it together. There's no real official report out of what's, what took place. None at all. So we're putting it, we're just guessing this. So we're guessing that there was a strong following current and a strong southerly wind which pushed that vessel to the left which made them do two things I would get. Well, it, this usually leads people to go a little faster, drive a little faster. And he was going over 13 knots at times up there at the end and when the speed limit's 8.6. So chances are that enhanced speed was related to the uh, fighting the environmental uh, conditions. So I'm going to leave that on the wind and current. And we've got a couple other background video, I mean, uh, background items to fill in about this uh, bank and cushion effect and, th and some other things to show. But for now, I'll stop with this.